You're listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. Hello, listeners, and welcome back to Luke's English Podcast. I hope you're feeling fine as you listen to this. Here is a new episode with my brother, James, all about music. Our choice this time, ambient music. So I hope you are in a comfortable position. Maybe go and make yourself a nice cup of tea, get relaxed, get comfortable. Take a nice, long, deep breath as we enter ambient mode on Luke's English Podcast. Podcast, 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 podcast. Hello, James. Welcome back onto the podcast. All right? Yeah, I'm all right. Yeah, you're all right. Yeah, not bad. Thanks. It's nice to have you back on. Yeah, nice to be back on. We've been wrangling with video and audio controls for the last 20 minutes, haven't we? We've but, uh, we, Yeah, we've been struggling to get this all set up properly with the audio, the video and the boo da boo da boo da boo da boo But I think we've done it. I think so, but we'll find out when I review the files later and then I realise, no, it didn't work properly. And I'm in the attic of my girlfriend's house and it's flipping cold. Well, it's not that cold, it's warming up, but it's been cold this morning and I've got a woolly hat on. So if mm -hmm. your audience wants to visualise me, I'm sitting here in, a, in an attic with a woolly hat on. And his listeners, his headphones are even bigger than mine. They're massive. I think it's quite... A, a sort of Craig David born to do it look I've got going on here, you know, with the woolly hat and the <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> You'll have to you can flash that up on screen if you want. <laughs> yeah. Big pair of headphones, woolly hat, kind of a goatee beard. Yeah. Nice sweater. Yeah, it's Craig David. Garage is back. Craig David's back. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So two this will go way over the head of everyone. We should maybe cut this Again, off. no one knows what we're talking about, but that's all right. I think I feel like every time that you are on this podcast, I always have that feeling of like, no one knows what we're talking about. No one's got a clue, but people seem to like it, you know? Yeah, well, yeah, good. good. I, sent, I sent you, James, I sent you the other day um, a screenshot of a comment, right, from Sporting a la Griesca. Wrote this, Happy New Year, Luke. I don't know if my English is improving significantly. I think it is, actually. Uh, but I can't stop listening to your podcast. Can't wait for another episode with James about music. So here we go. Well, there you go. Your your dream, well, not dreams, your, your mild requests have been answered. There's a mandate there from a listener, uh, which is to do another episode with you about music. So... Let's do it, okay? And the music that we've chosen today is ambient music. That's what we're going to talk mm. about, isn't it? <laughs> Shall I start playing some ambient music now? Yeah. Like this kind of stuff. Starts quietly. We're in the ambient zone now. Welcome to the... I can't hear anything. You can't hear anything? I thought we'd work that out so that you could so hear it. So did I. Oh, no, of course it's not going to work because... Um, <laughs> I turned off the mix minus on my audio oh, device. Oh, oh dear. But tell you what, oh. I'll play instead I'll play I'll play I'm gonna play this then. You can hear that, can't you? I can hear that. Play one of the newer ones though, don't play this one. Uh, Alright. Yeah, that's better. So what are we listening so, to? So we're listening to the sounds of ambient music. Um I should really read out the notes that I prepared, but I haven't prepared any. <laughs> um, well, what's this? Is this? Something I made. Something I made yesterday, um, hot off the press. Uh, sort of little, just sort of simple lines intertwining. <laughs> it's just a very simple little melodic. What would you call this M melodic theme? Yeah, played on a. Um, a, a sort of synth patch that I created myself, which is very easy to do. That's it. And I sent it to you and said, what do you want to this? Does it need anything else? Does it need another layer? 
I, I don't know. That's the thing about making ambient music, because this this is one of your ambient tracks. I, I like all of your ambient ones. I sort of prefer those ones, actually. Um, yeah. But it's yeah. It, is it necessary to add more? Sometimes less is more, isn't it? Paradoxically, yes. Yeah. So I mean, what else would you or could you add to this? Just some sort of atmospheric something. I don't know. I don't think it really needs anything. Anyway, let's not get bogged down in my lame ambient music. Let's talk about the godfathers of ambient music. What You know what? We should probably define ambient music. I know that would probably somehow spoil it, right? Defining not, it. Not but necessarily. So do you want to um, have a stab? Do you want to have a stab okay. at, at defining what is ambient music? Well, you can't, you can't mention ambient music without mentioning Brian Eno, who was the main sort of inventor or progressor of the form and I think he coined the term ambient music and it's basically it can either be a sort of very it's generally quite gentle and slow it can be used as background music some people think of it as sort of like audio wallpaper which is slightly insulting but it kind of doesn't necessarily shout for your attention it's very um, atmosphere, mood music that's just like a sort of audio Rothko painting mm -hmm. which is not really helping but sort of textures slow atmospheric sounds that are generally relaxing and kind of enhance your environment rather than trying to dominate or sort of grab your attention, they just sort of sit there in the background setting a mood yeah Exactly. And it's generally electronic, but it doesn't have to be. Some ambient music is made with acoustic and guitar-based instruments, string instruments, but uh, these days a lot of it is uh, sort of synth synthesised. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And uh, I think Eno, there's a few stories about how he invented it, but uh, the famous album that he he's probably most known for is Music for Airports. The story behind that, he was in a beautiful airport somewhere in, in Europe, uh, looking at this beautiful architecture and incredible technology and incredible f surfaces and textures that have been used throughout and this amazing feat of engineering and being piped through the speakers was really crappy kind of pop music. And he just thought all this environment is kind of ruined by this lame music, which is not at all fitting with the environment. And he decided he wanted to create an album of music that would fit that environment, that would enhance and suit an environment like that without dominating but just sort of sit there and just the opposite of the pop crappy pop music something that would set the mood and fit the place it came from a specific experience i was in a beautiful airport cologne airport um, which is a, a very beautiful building. Early one Sunday morning, the light was beautiful, everything was beautiful, except they were playing awful music. And I thought, there's something completely wrong that people don't think about the music that goes into situations like this. You know, they spend hundreds of millions of pounds on the architecture, on everything, except the music. The music comes down to someone bringing in a tape of their favourite songs this week and sticking them in and the whole airport is filled with the sound so I thought um, it would be interesting to actually start writing music for public spaces like that and I started to think so what kind of music would that have to be um, obviously it mustn't interfere with human communication so it has to be either higher or lower than voice sounds are um, it should last a very long time because you don't want changes all the time it should be possible to be interrupted by announcements and so on without suffering um, so I started to imagine a kind of music um, that would work in public spaces His first sort of ambient album is called Music for Airports. I think it's his first. Uh, there's also the the um, the one about Apollo, the Apollo mission. Yeah, which is maybe before. Actually, there are loads and loads of um, Brian Eno albums, uh, ambient ones, uh, a lot of them. 
I mean, we should also say Brian Eno was originally in Roxy Music, who were a kind of pop, glam rock, sort of glam pop act that were on top of the pops and very popular. Uh, Brian Ferry was the lead singer and they made kind of slightly Bowie-ish music, I suppose you could say, sort of glam. Glam rock, art and he, rock. But, yeah, art rock. And he was uh, in the background wearing the weirdest clothes and on synthesizers, which in those days were very big and expensive and no one really understood them. And he'd just be making all the weird bleepy bloopy atmospheric stuff. He also worked on Heroes by David Bowie. Uh, uh, and yeah. did and did a lot of the atmosphere like you know the actual song heroes has got this amazing drone kind of quality to it in the background he did all that so he's he's a very well established musical artiste before he started with his ambient work yeah a musician himself um as you say who worked with roxy music playing sort of synthesizers or keyboards but also he's worked as a producer uh he worked with david bowie as you say on, I think those those three albums uh, that Bowie did in the Berlin period, you know, there's Low and Lodger and Heroes. I think Eno was involved in all of them. And and in fact, the first one of those, Low, the second side of that album is full of atmospheric instrumental music. Um, and that's very Brian Eno sort of enabled or influenced. You know, Bowie was working very closely with him, I understand, in, in making that music. And then... Yeah. Also, Brian Eno worked with David Byrne from Talking Heads um, on a. They did a project together called "My Life in the Bush of Ghosts," and that's an instrumental album. It's not ambient, but it deals with lots of loops and samples, and it's like really a really in influential uh, album. But then on his own, um, yeah, he did music for airports in 1978. I mean, I think an, another Green World from 1975 has that famous one that's in Train Spotting. Um, or is that is that? Um, hang on, I should really check my facts before I start saying that. Yeah, another Green World from 1975 does have some tracks which are I would put into the ambient category, including the actual title track, which is called Another Green World, um, which is just an amazing. It was the opening. It was the music from a TV show that we used to see. Growing up, James, uh, the, it was a documentary oh, series yeah. called Arena. I wonder yes, if I brilliant. can play a little little sample of that. Hold on, I, I need to do it. Uh, Fantastic here. track. You probably not played too much, or you'll get struck off. There, there it is. Yeah, I probably can't play that too much because YouTube will go, uh, uh, uh. In fact, uh, another Green World is from 1975, and that's definitely got that atmospheric instrumental sound. And there's not, there's no drums in there, which is another key thing. Yeah, no, vo no vocals. Very, very rarely are there any vocals. No drums. Not really any bass either. Just nice sort of textural washes of sound yeah that's right um but ambient one music for airports 78 music for films also 1978 he he also released ambient two ambient three ambient four uh apollo atmospheres and soundtracks apollo's a really good one and it's got a lot of that one actually has got some steel guitar on it because it was about the apollo moon missions and he saw them as like cowboys in space so the cowboys bit is represented by the steel slide guitar, which um, really works with all the atmospherics and uh, electronic -y stuff. Yes, exactly. And and you know he does he he did more and more ambient stuff in the eighties and into the nineties and stuff like that. So yeah, um, um, Brian Eno is a is a reference point that's always used when talking about ambient music. You know, I asked you, so I asked you to define ambient music. You know, I do have another sort of fairly pithy um, definition of it. Okay. Here. You know what I did? You know what I did? You, I don't, I wonder how you're going to feel about this. I actually asked chat GPT to tell me. Uh, I've been playing with this earlier with my friend Dave. I've been sending him stuff, you know, we've been sending each other stuff to put into it. And uh, I, I will talk about that later, but yeah, go on. What does chat GDP have to say? 
ChatGPT is, is another story for another time, but this is what ChatGPT said about it. So I, I, I wrote into ChatGPT this. I said, write a summary of ambient music, including references to the main ambient music artists, history and influences. And it came up with this. Ambient music is a genre of music that emphasises the creation of a particular atmosphere or state of mind, often through the use of abstract or non-musical sounds or through the use of slow, evolving melodies and harmonies. The genre originated in the 1970s with the release of Brian Eno's Ambient One Music for Airports, which is considered one of the first ambient albums. Other influential ambient artists include Steve Roach, Harold Budd and Tangerine Dream. Ambient music has been influenced by a variety of other genres, including minimalism, experimental music and electronic music. It has also been used in a variety of settings, such as in film soundtracks, video game soundtracks and as background music in public spaces. Pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's it's very impressive, isn't it? It's slightly scary. But I tried some, I mean, quickly to talk about chat G P. What is it? G P. Chat G P T. Well, yeah, I tried a few more complicated things on it and it's not very good at thinking for itself, funnily enough, because mm -hmm. it just regurgitates popular opinion, basically, it's from what I can tell, you know. So it misses a few things. And if it doesn't know much about a particular subject, it's really good at padding out with waffle like a good student should be so i don't think it's there yet but um and i think it's just regurgitates popular opinion like i asked it to, to write something about rave culture waffled on about the usual tab um, the usual broadsheet kind of stuff the kind of stuff that goes in the guardian saying it was a reaction against the political times it's like no it wasn't yeah like sorry rave culture was not a reaction to anything political just it may have been a coincidence but it wasn't a conscious reaction to anything not it wasn't like the 60s Yes. I don't think. Yeah, I agree. I think and that there was no there was no mention of drugs in the whole article. Which yeah. is, you know, it's not the, the be all and end all, but it's something that has to be mentioned, same as the sixties you should mention it as well. Mm -hmm. And I just got the impression it was just regurgitating some quite weak Guardian articles, basically. But that's what chat GPT does. Yeah, it, it collates collates what's been written already and rephrases it. Yeah. It, like it's got a huge sample a database of of um, English usage, and it just, it actually builds its sentences and its paragraphs and stuff word by word. Uh, but it's it's incredibly complicated. Anyway, that's a whole other episode for yeah. another time. I was impressed, but also slightly concerned that it was just, I mean, that's what happens in society anyway, but it's just revoicing the status quo. And it doesn't ever, it doesn't, it didn't seem to offer any interesting takes on anything. It just seemed to regurgitate very much the standard accepted meaning of things. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of sort of um, alternative viewpoints or, or critical uh, analysis of, of not of not really or critical analysis of the of the status quo, if you know what I mean. Like people always say this about something, but actually I think it's about this. It just goes well it just says people always say this about it, therefore that's what it is. Right. Yeah, it just regurgitates the mainstream, most common uh, yeah. viewpoint on yeah. something, and then that just becomes the fact about yeah. about that thing. Um, all right. Anyway, let's let's not We're get stuck getting on, sidetracked on this. by ChatGPT, um, but it's very 2023, isn't it? What that? does GPT stand for? Uh, I don't know. Great pissing technology. <laughs> Great pissing technology. <laughs> it just pisses out all these words, but it does it very well. Yeah. Anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, right, let's let's try and stick to the subject let's, here. Let's steer this ambient truck back on course. Yeah, we're, we're essentially, listeners here in this ambient episode, we're essentially drifting in a sort of a boat uh, across yeah. the ambient waters, slowly drifting towards our destination. The destination being that everyone knows what ambient music is and that we've talked about it in coherent terms for the duration of the episode. And everyone likes to start listening to it for the good of their own health. Yeah, so do you think ambient music is a positive thing? I think it's very useful. I think it's a very practical form of music. It's almost, I mean, Brian Eno, again, has started talking about, started, you see the way I said that? That's the way Eno talks. 
drops all his T's, like he's, a trans, sort of transatlantic sort of voice. He's got a slightly American sounding British accent. Yeah. Um, he, anyway, um, he s- tends to see his music for more in the realms of healthcare and mental health than entertainment these days. Mm. So, I mean, he's actually been commissioned by hospitals, you know, private rich ones to create music for their waiting rooms and things like that. And he sees his music more in that realm, I think as a kind of, um, health thing rather than just an entertainment thing. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm trying to say? I, so I it can, it's, it's actually quite good for you to listen to ambient music and it can be a sort of beneficial to your mood and state of mind and help you get to sleep and that kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I sh- maybe we can just quickly read out some of the things that Eno has said about his music. He says ambient music is intended to enhance the atmospheric and, a- and acoustic environment of a space. Yeah. yeah. So it's if it's your if it's your room, your study, your room where you study, you've got your desk and stuff. There'll be birds singing outside. There might be the sound of uh, the rain outside or maybe the wind blowing through the trees. And for him, ambient music is designed to fit into that atmospheric environment so that it actually uh, um, enhances all these other atmospheric things. So I often listen to ambient music when I am out and about, if I'm going to work or coming back from work or just going to the supermarket. And I like to have Brian Eno's music, like, for example, this morning when I came home from dropping my daughter off at school, I listened to uh, Brian Eno's album Thursday Afternoon. It's just called Thursday Afternoon, 1985. This is a sample of it. Sounds like this, right? So I was just kind of walking through the streets of Paris. I popped into the supermarket. I bought some bananas. I went to the boulangerie. I bought some bread. You know, just the usual things. I got onto the metro, which was quite crowded. But I had this going off in the background. Now I could still hear the other sounds, the sounds of the metro doors opening and closing, you know, the sounds of people walking along, people talking in the background. But I had this Brian Eno stuff going on in the background and it it just sort of helps me to stay cool and calm and not get too stressed. If I'm doing all those things without Brian Eno playing, it can all be a bit sort of, what's the word for it? It can Things can get a bit stressful, but when you've got that kind of bed of pleasant sound accompanying you, it seems to make you slow down and in fact seems to make me feel a little more calm. It's pleasant. It actually makes every little exp- every little thing you're doing much more pleasant and enjoyable. I agree. So Briny Note continues in uh, in this quote, whereas conventional background music is produced by stripping away all sense of doubt and uncertainty from the music, ambient music retains these qualities. And whereas their intention is to brighten the environment by adding stimulus to it, that's the sort of conventional background music you might get in the supermarket or something, their intention is to brighten the environment by adding some stimulus, thereby alleviating the tedium of routine tasks. Okay. Ambient music is intended to induce calm and a space to think. Ambient music must be able to accommodate many levels of listening attention without enforcing one in particular. It must be as ignorable as it is interesting. So it's meant to allow you to concentrate better and to, yeah, essentially fit into your environment. It's not there to grab your attention. It's there to just sort of accompany those moments and make them better. (laughs) I hope I'm clear. I think we've spoken enough about Eno for now, but yeah. um, he's the godfather of it all. We, we, we've talked a lot about Brian Eno, but that's always that always happens when you have a conversation about ambient music. But if we take him and that first album, Music for Airports, as our starting point, now we could go back from there or we can come forward from there. I just want to say a couple of things about going back from there. And actually, there's always stuff in classical music which is kind of the yeah. same thing, and and we can we can look at um, French classical music, um, especially the work of uh, Eric 
Sati. I think that's how you say it. Yeah, I, I hear I hear that name a lot, but I've never actually. Listened oh, to you his will stuff, know it. Think. You'll definitely know it. Really? Uh, Eric Sati. Eric Sati. Uh, Sati. I suppose it's it's Sati. Yeah, Eric Sati. Okay, so he was a um, a French composer. Uh, born in 1866, died 1925. So 1880s, right? We're talking about the 1880s, mm-hmm. French classical music from the 1880s. So I'm actually just going to read something from Wikipedia here because it's just easier, all right? So uh, as an early 20th century French composer and late 19th century, Eric Sati used... Dadaist inspired explorations to create an early form of ambient or background music that he labeled furniture music, music d'ameublement, furniture music. This he described as being the sort of music that could be played during a dinner to create a background atmosphere for that activity rather than serving as the focus of attention. So if we just think about music and what it's for, most of the time when music is played, we are supposed to listen to it, right? We're supposed to listen to it specifically. You know, like if you listen to the Beatles, you listen to the words, you listen to the melodies, there's the verse, there's the chorus, and you listen to the song from start to finish, right? But ambient music and, you know, certainly the work of Eric Satie was designed not to be focused on, but like Brian Eno said, it could be ignored, but it's there as a f- to provide a function which is to essentially accompany moments that you have in your day, either a dinner party or just when you're sitting and studying or if you're walking through a stressful city, those sorts of things. So uh, I've got to just play you probably the most famous Eric Satie piece. Um, See see if I recognise it. It's got to be the the gymnopédie, I would say. You're definitely going to know this. Here we go. He wrote this? Yeah. Had no idea. Yeah, lovely. It's nice, isn't it? I mean, that's basically the... uh, TV shorthand for this is relaxing. Yeah. You know, when they play, so when, when they're on the TV show and they want to show something satisfying and relaxing, they just play this music. Yeah. There's I like mean, a it's certain be- go to songs, and this is one of them, isn't it? Like a lot of classical music, it's become a kind of a cliche because you've heard it so many times. But what I've you, only ever but, heard the first 20 seconds. But you probably haven't, you, you've only heard it in certain situations. Those situations are when it's played in the background of an advertisement or when it's played in the background of a TV series or something. It's not because you've chosen to listen to it and discovered it yourself. So unfortunately, yeah. what happens with those bits of classical music is the associations we have with them are defined by the advertising we've seen or whatever, like, you know. It looks like it should be an m and chocolate mousse or something. This is Marks and Spencers. You know, it's always something like yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, but there are others as well. Um, so this is another one of, of Eric Satie's pieces. And this one, for me, is a bit more... It sounds a bit more ambient. I read something that he said about this piece of music. He said it was designed... He wanted to create some music that was the musical equivalent of kind of tidying away a bookcase tidying away books into a bookcase. You know the satisfying feeling you get when you you're, maybe your room is a bit untidy and you tidy things away and you put the books back in the right place on the bookcase and there's something very therapeutic about doing that, right? Yeah. Everything goes back in its right place and it ends up being tidy. So this is the musical equivalent of that. And it's a really interesting idea because as you'll hear, it's just like very simple chords and they all resolve. The music is constantly resolving and going back. It's like it's sort of folding itself back up and putting itself back on the shelf musically. It sounds like this. You see what I mean? Yeah, very, very nice. That's. Oh, I think that is kind of ambient music because it's designed to put you in the right headspace. 
you know? Yeah, yeah. So that's the that's some stuff from the past. I mean, we could explore other things like 60s experimental music and just like the very first synthesizer music. There's one album I've got by uh, Chick Corea called um, Return to Forever. Mm-hmm. I, I bought you that. Very good choice. It's very nice. So this this is 1972, Chick Corea Return to Forever. And this is like technically described as being fusion music. But let's have a listen to this. Mm-hmm. Try track two for a sec. Here, yeah, but with but that's, definitely that's good. In, in the that's... same sort of frame of mind. It, it, it definitely. I mean, the, the, if we go down the jazz angle, we can go all the way back to sort of Miles Davis and the, the, the sound that he had in the late 50s, which was like that whole cool jazz thing, Yeah, which is kind of the same thing again. Uh, it's all about atmosphere and it's very slow and atmospheric and you have albums like Kind of Blue, which is has got a bit, a touch of the ambient about it um, and some of his later work as well. Um, okay. Let's move forward. I mean, there was a huge wave along with kind of electronic music having its sort of, you know, real moment in the kind of early 90s. There was a lot of, or late 80s, early 90s, there was a lot of people like, I mean, two that jumped to mind, Aphex Twin and the KLF and the Orb to say three, Hmm. say three. Um, I mean, a lot of people know Aphex Twin. His first two albums are very, very wonderful ambient tracks. I mean, the first one's kind of ambient with a bit of dance. So there's um, beats, there's there's like... There's you know, some beats. beats I mean, it's kind of to. sort of post-rave ambient music, you could say, or sort of rave-influenced ambient music, where it's a crossover between kind of house and techno. I mean, there are some techno tracks that are actually pretty um, ambient. Rhythm is rhythm, chaotic harmony. Try that. Derek May. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It fits fits the bill, doesn't it? Yeah, this is sort of like late 80s, early 90s. It's 92, I've got there. 92, you've got there, okay. Yeah, and then... And then Aphex Twin, of course. Aphex Twin is the don of this kind of stuff, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, It's sort of rave-influenced, but definitely ambient at the same time. Track two on Selected Ambient Works, 1985 to 1992, which is absolutely one of my favourite albums of all time. Do you know why it's called Tha? The track two is called Tha. No, I don't know why. Short for Samantha. Oh, that is Girlfriend. She was Girlfriend at the time, yeah. Ah, oh, how sweet. So it sounds like this. We'll skip to the middle. A lot of reverb. Yeah, I remember listening to that at, at, Lemming, at Lemington Spa train station in 1996 <laughs> and being struck by how wonderful it was. Try track uh, one. Yeah, track one is obviously the classic. And there's obviously... Obviously, Ambient Works 2, which is completely ambient. No beats at all in Ambient Works 2. Yeah. I mean, the weird thing about... One of the many weird things about this album, the Aphex Twin album, he wrote some of those when he was about 14. Yeah. Because the dates are 85 to 92. He's about my age, which is like late 40s. Yeah, there's at least one track on that album that he must have done when he was about 15 or something. Yeah, Yeah. Aphex Twin is incredible because... He's so talented and so original. Yeah, um, he really is. And everyone else follows where he leads, I think. Um, he's he's just incredible. He's, he must be an alien or something. Yeah, absolutely. Like one of... I recently put an Aphex Twin sticker in the background of my pod room because I felt I had to represent... Richard D. James, the Aphex Twin, incredible, incredible artist. And there's, you, could, you could do a whole podcast on him, really. Yeah, I could. Um, if we just go to like one of my favourite playlists on Spotify, which is just, this is Aphex Twin. The play, But it's all really good. You know, you've got things like... Uh, what's my favourite one? I mean, this is very Brian Eno, isn't it, this one? This is from Selected Ambient Works Volume... T- volume 1, actually, the first one. Yeah. yeah. Avril the 14th. 
Yeah, Avril the 14th is one of the most well-known ones. There's people like, there's loads of cover versions of this on YouTube. People playing it on different instruments and things in different situations. In fact, YouTube these days is a great place to go for ambient music mixes. And there's there's like loads of different ambient music mixes on YouTube. There's channels like Chill Hop, which is not exactly ambient, but it's quite nice music to have on in the background, kind of low low tempo atmospheric stuff. And there are ambient mixes for computer game music. So you've got like Legend of Zelda ambient mixes where someone has basically used the Legend of Zelda music, but they've done it in a beatless sort of ambient way. And there's Star Wars ambient study music and all sorts of other things. I mean, it's more like con contemporary classical in a way, isn't it? In a weird way. And he did work with Philip Glass, who is from the world of classical music. So it's interesting yeah. the way all these things bleed together. You've got electronic music, you've got classical music, all the boundaries, just forget about all the boundaries. It doesn't matter. It's just music that has a certain function, which is to put you in a calm, meditative and clear-minded state. Did you hear the thing he did with the swinging piano? Uh, Aphex uh, Twin? Yeah, at a, uh, I think it was at the BFI British, or somewhere, somewhere on the South Bank, some sort of theatre. He had a show where he had a, uh, a machine that plays the piano. So you sequence it and it plays the, the, um, the, the melody, on, plays the keys on a piano. And had a grand piano suspended on a huge pulley, like a rope, that would swing back and forth across the stage, a huge arc, and play the music while it was swinging across the room. So there's this huge grand piano playing a quite simple melody, swinging, you know, 18 feet in the air on either side. And this amazing acoustic, which, you know, have you ever heard that before? <laughs> Someone no. playing the piano? <laughs> it's, it's, not even, it's not even a person. He's, no, it's not he's a person. made a machine. It's, I don't know if he made it, but he, he, he has access to this machine, which will play a melody on the piano while it's being swung across the room. Wait, it's a machine that kind of sits in front of the piano and has kind of like fingers or something that presses the keys? It's not really a, a form, it's just a machine that just plays the notes you know, from a strip, I believe, of sort of, you know, fingers, so you could say, but it's not like a robot or anything. It's not like, hi, I'm you know, <laughs> the ambient robot, nice to meet you. Da -da 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 -da. No, he, he, he's a really interesting character and he always does new and innovative stuff. Yeah, and some of his stuff is quite scary and disturbing and then other stuff is really blissful and and lovely. Yeah. Um, but it's it's all like really really unique and amazing. It's amazing. A friend of mine sold him a drum machine actually. Oh really? Because he modifies drum machines and bits of gear. I've, I've got a video about it somewhere. But your um, friend does. Uh, it's I've, I'll send you the YouTube link. But um, he was selling one of these things, and a guy turned up to buy it called Richard. And they sat down for a half an hour and discussed it and went through the features of this modified drum machine and he sort of looked really interested and they had a bit of a nerd off nerdy chat, him and his, you know, other friend and this guy Richard. And then he left and they both looked at each other and was like, Was that Aphex twin? They were like, Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because he's and, a bit uh, of a mysterious character. Like before Banksy came along, Aphex Twin was doing that kind of um, thing already where no one knew who he was. There were lots of sort of myths about him, like that he owned his own tank, that he lived in a cave in Cornwall, that he lived in the island at Elephant and Castle in London in a, in a bunker. You know, all these sorts yeah. of stories that people would say about him. He was a semi-mythical figure, really. I've seen him play a couple of times and I've been, you know, within feet of him through the chicken wire of a DJ booth, kind of <laughs> my hands kind of stuck to the staring outside Staring at him. Is it really staring him? Staring at him. Oh my God, it's Richard. Oh my God. Richard D. James. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan. I think he's brilliant. Yeah, me too. Do you want to mention any other uh, ambient artists? God, there's so many of them. I mean, there's. we should definitely mention the KLF album, Chill Out, mm -hmm. which is kind of the Citizen Kane of ambient albums, I think which uh -huh. is a completely meaningless phrase, but it's um, <laughs> it's amazing. And it was also, it's by the two guys from the KLF, Jimmy Colty and um, Bill Drummond. Yeah. But it's also uncredited is uh, Alex Patterson from the uh, the Orb. Yeah. Was a major contributor to this album. He didn't get a credit, which is, seems really unfair. But um, it's kind of like the Brian Eno Cowboys in Space thing crossed with 
a kind of road trip across America. Yeah. Crossed with, I don't know. I don't know what. I mean, it's, it's maybe it's more than the sum of its parts. Mm-hmm. It's one of these albums. It's just, it creates a mood so powerful that you think there must be some mystic meaning behind it all, but um, maybe there isn't. Um, maybe it's just a really good ambient album. But play, play a bit of that. Uh, okay. I'll just jump in at like track two. This is from yeah. uh, Chill Out by the KLF. Full of, full of sound effects, full of little snippets of radio, which I think came from American radio in the South. I'm just going to jump straight into the middle of the track. Beeps. So th- here's a train going by. Just sound of a here for a sec. freight train passing in stereo. Probably going to have oh, to gonna come in now as well. Oh, and it's dogs, like dogs and sheep and stuff in the like background. Like shepherds up in Tibet or something. Yeah, you, you sit here, all sorts of wonderful sounds, like the sounds of dogs barking, and it goes woof, 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 <laughs> randomly. Um, but yeah, the, I mean, the uh, this is the KLF, but also the Orb are probably the more famous uh, exponents of that kind of thing. You should talk about the Orb a bit, because you're a big Orb fan, aren't you? I, I love the Orb, especially the first two albums. The first album, 1992? I think 91 uh, is the the Orb's Adventures Beyond the Ultra World and then yeah. the other album is called UF Orb. Uh, but the Adventures Beyond the Ultra World is probably the best one and it's it's very much like this KLF album. Um it's a sort of a a journey into space really. Um and so it does tell a little story it go first of all it there's a there's a blast off and then you're in space, and then it's sort of oh, it's just absolutely amazing and wonderful. But what el- what other elements are what other elements are there to the orb? So there's 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 the there's like nice melodies and pleasant sounds, you know, like some of those noises we just heard. But also on top of that, they add uh, there's beats that you could dance to sometimes. But as well, there are loads and loads of other things going on. Lots of samples, lots of... What, what musical influence would you say? Come on, I'm, I'm oh, fishing uh, Pink, for a specific... Pink Floyd, no, probably. Another no, one, another one. Another influence, not Pink Floyd. Oh, uh, the Beatles, Revolution 9? Well, I'm going to say dub, dub reggae. Oh, dub, dub reggae, of course, yeah. Because they had the bass player, um, Jar Wobble, from Public Image Limited, who was on that album, and he plays some wicked dub reggae bass lines. Right, in his own inimitable fashion. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, and that's a big contributor. And I think dub, I mean, that you've heard that African dub volume two, is it? With all the, the cuckoo clock samples and... I bought that for you. Yeah, Again. Well, play a bit of that. I mean, uh, or maybe play the orb first. Uh, maybe go for the orb first. But there's a huge influence of dub on the orb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, gosh. Adventures Beyond the Ultra World, 1991. Earth Gaia. I mean, the first time you heard Earth Gaia is pretty insane. Let's go for Perpetual Dawn. There's a, definitely a dub influence here. We're going to have to jump into the middle of the track. This is not going to make it onto YouTube, I feel, but so be it. You definitely hear that dub bass line. So, so this is a track from that album, and this is a moment where everything's a lot more upbeat and dancey. But there are also Spanish castles in space. Track five. Yeah, Spanish castles in space is absolutely brilliant. One of my favourite pieces of music. We just we'll jump into the middle. So, as well as these pleasing melodies and different sounds. They also put in samples of things happening. For example, in this one, there's samples of cars driving by, as if you are sitting in the front room of a house in suburbia in England, and you just often will hear a car. There's quite a funny use of samples in the orb as well. There are funny samples as well, like they have... These Monty Python and... um what else? What other classics are there in there? Funny news, funny little news reports, um, and yeah, clips from Monty Python and other little things just start to come in. And so, if in that way, if we want to get intellectual about it, which maybe we don't, but I'm going to anyway, um, it's like music concrete, right? Which is a sort of avant-garde music from the when? 
Okay, music concrete is, uh, again, a French thing. It's a type of music composition that utilises recorded sounds as raw material. Yeah, lots of people do that in ambient music. You have real field recordings, they call it. Yeah, like we had in that KLF album where there's the sheep in, in the field, the sound of the train going by. Um, in the orb, you've got the sound of cars driving past. You've got like recording things sampled from the radio, little news reports, things sampled from... Um, movies and stuff that end up in there. It creates this really interesting oral world. That, kind of that, collage, a sort of audio collage. Exactly. And that's that's also like the Beatles because that, that strange track, Revolution 9, is a perfect example of music concrete because it, they've just taken all these weird samples from different places, bits of classical music here, little bits of recorded conversation here, and thrown it all together to create this bewildering um, collage. I love that. I, I love Revolution 9. The Orb have sampled Revolution number 9 as well. Really? That number 9, number 9, number 9. Number 9? It's, it's in the Orb somewhere. Is it really? Yeah. That's quite good. That's good. Yeah, they've, uh, the Orb have got a sense of humour, which is yeah, one of the best have. things about them. Um, where where can we go now, James? Is there anything else we can do? I mean, okay, can we, I have a look at my list? Um, yeah, have a look at your list. Well, look, we've got to give a mention to Mixmaster Morris. Absolutely. Who's the kind of patron saint of ambient and chill out music. <clears throat> He's a kind of uh, sort of slightly strange looking bald uh, skinhead guy in a very silvery jacket usually or very psych he sort of seems to be permanently psychedelicized but I've chatted to him a couple of times and he's actually very clever very clued up tuned in down to earth down to earth intelligent rational human being um, but I last time I saw him was at Glastonbury and he was wearing a chicken suit while DJing <laughs> So, no, but he's brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant. And Mixmaster Morris. Mixmaster Morris. He's number one on Mixcloud for chill out and ambient music. He's a DJ. He's a producer. He makes music under the name Irresistible Force. He's got many good albums to his name. Yeah. Well worth checking out. Mm -hmm. uh, big shout out to Mixmaster Morris. Um, Sun Electric. They're a German duo, I believe. Their, their, their best album for ambient music is a live album. I think it's called Live in Amsterdam or Live Somewhere. It's a yellow cover. So Sun Electric are good. And, well, we've got loads of other names. I mean, you, Os you oh, James. You. Okay, you. I should mention Oscillate, which was a club in Birmingham in the early 90s. Oscillate, which yeah. Which we both, we both used to frequent from time to time. Mm -hmm. And they were more in the dub, dance, electronic kind of less straight up ambient but more ambient dance crossover stuff but they APL and HIA higher intelligence agency and a positive life have some quality stuff yeah definitely more in the kind of dance realm there's there's, there's millions of artists that we could I mention. mean I should also mention Neo Tantra they're quite big on Bandcamp and I've been on a couple of the Neo Tantra albums with my compositions Neo Tantra is basically a set of compilations of sort of independent ambient artists yeah. and um, they will they put out new co uh, collections very regularly every few months there's a new they one do, yeah. and you've been you've been in there too and so what I've about you then James um, what about your music because you you make music on and you publish it on Bandcamp uh, Jim dot hold on a second I, I can think it's just it's Jim Thompson dot Bandcamp dot com um, I'm actually going to put out a new one to go with the release of this podcast i think because mm -hmm. so i've got a few tracks that i've been sort of saving up for a while anyway so i thought i might as well put them out at the same time as this so if you want to hear that go to me Bandcamp page do you know what the out al the album's going to be called at this stage i think it's going to be called ambient mode ambient mode okay ambient mode because i mean i do make music in various different modes you know techno mode and guitar -y mode but this is ambient mode Let's have a little little sample in the background. This is James in ambient mode. This one is called Ambisoft. Well, that's the working title. It that's may change. Okay, but that's the working title. You're, you're getting an exclusive preview here. I quite like the title Ambisoft. It sounds like you could have been a software developing company from the early nineties. Yeah, sort of something to do with Amstrad. Computer, yeah, making very early home uh, computer games. Yeah. 
on a sort of 8 bit is, format or something. This was the one I questioned to you whether this is finished or does it need another, you know, does ambient music have to be complex? Can it be very simple? Can it be, does it need anything else? For me, it what I'd like to have a couple of those slightly odd little samples. I'd love it in ambient music when there are little samples of people speaking. You can almost, you can almost not hear them but if you focus you can hear what they're saying and if you've chosen it correctly they're saying something kind of funny so I'd like yeah. a little sample from the radio of people talking about a funny thing that almost not audible and with a lot of reverb and echo on it please I did that with one of the Neo Town tracks it was actually just after Andy Weatherall had died and I thought this track needs something mysterious and I just thought I'm going to put some Andy Weatherall's voice in this so I found an interview with him and I had it recorded so low and so reverby you can't actually tell um it's i don't think it's on there it's on maybe i'll send it to you maybe i haven't it's called 5 39 a.m i think see if you can hear a bit of andy okay do you know when it's near the start it's right at the start but it's very 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 muffled It's nice, I like your ambient stuff. Yeah. We can't hear what he's saying at all, but there's no, definitely there's definitely a human voice. Just the tone of a human voice in the background. Again, it's or... a bit it's a bit like when you're in certain public spaces like a station or something where there's an announcement but it's on yeah. the other side of the station and the announcement echoes around the station. It creates an interesting yeah. atmosphere. It's good. I, I really like all your ambient stuff. Um, I wanted to just play a little section of the track called I might, I Drift. I might put that on my new, my new album because it's only on that Neo Tantra thing and there's no reason why I can't put it on mine as well. Okay. This one is called Drift. I've listened to this one a lot. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into the middle of this, if I can. This is the one that's got this. You put some cars driving by in this one yeah, as well. Yeah. So what I like about that is you've got the drone going on, which is a common feature in ambient music. That's a constant drone. But also you've got the sound of waves, I think or the sound of cars driving by. It's not entirely sure which one is which. And then you've got other little sounds that are higher up in the, uh, they're a bit higher in terms of their tone. So you've got things that go like that up there. So that's quite a nice thing to be able to have where you've got some deep sounds. And then you've got <coughs> the drone in the middle and then you've got little glittery sounds that come up at the top as well. So that's maybe something you could add to the other tracks, some little uh, details at the high end. Up, up a note. Uh, yeah. It's the sort of music that I might play if I'm struggling to sleep. I'll just put that on and it takes my mind off other things. It just somehow takes all the edges off. Maybe there's something, I mean, I don't know how it all works, but uh, the fact that there's constant sound and it's non-specific, it allows your mind to kind of drift a little bit in a, in, a, in a nice way. White noise, they call it. It prevents your mind from focusing specifically on certain things, which can be a bit problematic when you're trying to sleep. You know, you don't want your mind to be occupied by specific thoughts. You want it to be able to kind of just blend and drift and and it's it's I'm sure it's healthy as well to have that kind of thing. White noise is what they call that, that kind of constant sort of hiss or kind of hum. But I think that can is kind of related to being in the womb because you're always hearing that kind of rush of blood around the body and in your ears, you know, when you're kind of very kind of cocooned in an environment. You can hear the blood in your ears. It's kind of that kind of sensation of being very sort of, well, back in the womb, I suppose, almost. Yeah. 
Absolutely. You know, and it kind of, yeah, it does white noise. I mean, it reminds you of the, you know, flow of water or waves crashing, you know, sort of perpetual kind of background particles. <laughs> I think we completely, completely didn't do the very uh, academic analysis of this, did we really? Or that's no, all right. It's it's a it's a non academic analysis of uh, ambient music, I suppose. But also, just to come back to Brian Eno again, yeah, he's got some good apps that you can download on your phone. Um, one of them is called Bloom, and Bloom is actually really good fun. It's um, essentially uh, you can cr you can create ambient music with it, or just listen to ambient music with it. So I'm using it now, James. You won't be able to hear this. I think, uh, but um, I'm just playing with it now. So it, on the screen, you have like pleasing atmospheric colors that blend from blue into green and into pink and yellow and stuff. And it has a, a bed of sound which accompanies the music, uh, which accompanies it. And then if you touch the screen, little ripples appear on the screen and, and you get a sound like this single piano note and that will eventually repeat there it is again is repeated now I can touch the screen again maybe two fingers So depending on where you touch the screen, you get high notes, low notes, and they repeat at different speeds. And so you can create this ambient soundscape, which you can just have on in the background, and maybe every now and then you can just lean over and just like touch the screen and can keep the music going. So that's Bloom, which is great. And then another one that I really like is called Air. Similar idea but you've got like a, a series of panels and if you touch a panel you get a piano note and the app sort of creates some atmospheric sound based on the note that you've chosen it'll play a low note and that's quite fun to play with yeah I love those apps I always thought it'd be quite cool to have a if you had a house party, you could have a big screen on the wall, you know, like a big flat screen or touch screen type thing and just have that on in one of the rooms and have some very subtle lighting and just have people, because you could just touch it and walk away and it'll play itself. Yeah. Or if people want to re rewrite it, they just touch the screen again and it happens again. I mean, Eno's got this theory that in the future, we might not be listening to pre-recorded pop music. We'll all have little devices or apps which will, will say... Okay, play something kind of chilled out, slow BPM with some piano, and it'll just start generating music. Like the equivalent to your taste, of to your taste, the equivalent of Chat GPT, but for music, where you just say, hey, "Just play some um, sort of uh, funk music, but kind of slow and atmospheric, with uh, no singing and no saxophone. Just I just want keyboards, bass, and guitar, and yeah. synthesizer, and it'll yeah. just." generate the music for you <laughs> and we'll all be doing that on the fly if we want to i mean i don't know if that's going to be the case all the time because i think people always will want stars or acts to follow i think personalities they'll always engage with humans more than a computer but i think there'll definitely be a place for it for spontaneously generated ai music i mean we're almost there with eno's stuff i mean he's got computer programs where you exactly how i said you know you say okay i want own, I don't want any harsh notes. I want sort of very uh, harmonious collection of notes. I don't want any snare drums. I just want a f subtle hi hats and slow BPM, please. And it will just generate stuff for you on the yeah. fly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it'll get to the point where we won't be able to tell if it was made by a person or if it was made by a machine, which is a little bit scary. I think you can't tell now. 
I mean, they already have AI-generated music, don't they? I mean, I haven't actually heard any. I'll play some, actually, that I got Go on, uh, um, from a... This is the last thing we're going to do, because we've got to finish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, there used to be a, a thing called Juke Deck, which uh, I think got um, bought by someone else, so that doesn't really exist anymore. But it allowed you to download the music. You, you could just, like, set the parameters. It would create the music for as long as you want. So you could say three minutes, two minutes, six minutes, uh, mm-hmm. whatever. You could say, like, low tempo, these instruments, blah, blah, blah. And it would do it. And um, and you could use the music sort of royalty free. You know, it was a kind of a beta right, clever, level clever, uh, clever. program, which is now it's been purchased by some other company. I think it's TikTok that actually bought it. Um, but uh, so then I, so it came up with some nice music. So some of it was ambient. I'm going to try and find some of that ambient stuff. Yeah, this. I've used this before. I used this in our British uh, f- true or false quiz. I'm not hearing anything, man. You're not hearing anything. Hold on. I'll make that happen. Wow. wow. So this is just made by artificial intelligence. Not bad. It's useful. Not bad at all. It's it's useful when I want sort of an atmospheric sort of who wants to be a millionaire soundscape in the background of an episode. Right, so there you go, James. There you go. Listeners, I hope that we've managed to talk in a coherent and interesting way about this subject. Um, If you are interested in listening to ambient music, you don't really know where to get started. Just go to the episode page for this episode on my website and there'll be some suggestions for you, uh, including maybe a couple of YouTube mixes and some Spotify playlists and some other things. And my new EP. And James's new EP, of course, which will be called Ambient Mode. Yes. Okay, and you'll be able to Moda Ambiente. (laughs) <laughs> what's that is that italian i, don't know, I think it's spanish probably really something, something latin <laughs> yeah we don't know but anyway check out the page for this episode where you'll find those those things okay thank you james that's all right uh, i feel like we should drift off into sort of a sam- sample rich sort of plateau of lush atmospherics now well i think we should probably do that with a bit of your music so i'm gonna I mean, it'd be tempting to do this whole episode with loads of reverb and delay on everything and just talking over sort of constant soundscape, but they wouldn't be able to understand anything we were saying. No, but it would sound nice. Slow burn. Put on slow burn. Wait, where, how do I find slow burn? Is that on? It's the new one. It's one of the new ones. Okay. God, I need the toilet so much. Okay, maybe you better go because pissing yourself isn't very ambient. <laughs> <laughs> oh, am I going to keep that in? Uh, hold on. Okay, so I'll keep this playing in the background for the rest of the episode. Okay. Thank you, James. Let's let's call, call it a day. day. Okay. okay. Um, thanks, thanks everyone. everyone. I hope you enjoyed, enjoyed that. that. And, and go, go and listen to some ambient music, music and just chill, chill out. out. Just relax. I've got some text here, which is one of my favourite bits of sleeve notage, sleeve notes, from one of my favourite ambient albums, the Positiva Ambient Collection. Do you remember that one? Yeah. And, and it was put, to, put together by Andrew Weatherall, who died last year, sadly, who was a bit of a legend on the scene. Yeah. Um, a sort of early Acid House DJ and remixed Primal Scream and remixed uh, many influential artists. And it was a big, big influential guy on the scene. Yeah. Um, but he wrote these sleeve notes, and his alter ego is Lord Saber. Lord Saber, nice. From his group Sabers of Paradise. Mm-hmm. So this is his attempt to um, describe ambient music, but he's done it in the form of a story. Ooh, so like are, you re- are you ready? Oh yeah, very. I love these notes. Okay, here we go. 
A jumbled office. I'm seated on a swivel chair. Large amounts of screwed up paper litter the floor. I have been asked to compliment this collection of ambient music with a brief description of the genre. Hmm. Simple sleeve notes will not do for the selection of compositions I have before me. I needed help and there was only one thing to do. Consult Lord Sabre, the revered sage and mystic, to hopefully garner some sort of response that would in some way help with this task in hand. Journeying for days, I eventually reached the dark, foreboding, neo-gothical portals of Sabre's Hall. Apprehension was tightening every fibre in my body as I approached the huge wooden front door. The Lord was not the sort of person one could just drop in on, and I had not managed to warn him that our monthly consultation would be several days early. My fears, however, were totally unfounded as Witherspoon, his trusted manservant and personal physician, greeted me with a total look of calm set into his malleable features. He spoke slowly and surely. The master has sensed your troubled mind and awaits you in the great hall. I entered into his presence and placed the audio cassette before him. Silently, he reached out and with his skull ring covered tattooed hand, picked it up. Leave me now, he said softly and swept into the listening chamber with a flurry of his velvet cape obediently following behind. Two hours passed slowly, interrupted at intervals by the foreboding chimes of the large clock further down the hall, which mingled with the muffled sounds emanating from behind the chamber doors. Eventually the doors parted and my lord stood silhouetted beneath the towering oak frame, clouds of sweet-smelling smoke billowing around him. I stood staring, expectancy and the need for enlightenment written large upon my face. Taking me by the arm, he led me back into the listening chamber. The door shut silently behind us, causing the smoke to swirl around our feet. My nerves manifested myself as I humbly stuttered my thoughts. Uh, I, I, you, you see, ambient music as a, as a recognisable form was initially espoused by B B Brian Eno, who saw it as a functional sort of music that could just as easily be ignored as listened to. Environmental music, I babbled on for minutes, theorising, analysing, constructing and then deconstructing arguments on what ambient music was or should be, until I had said more than enough. Lord Sabre raised his finger to a set of pursed lips, and after politely silenced me, spoke. It's all gone beyond that now. Later, as I stretched out on the lower deck of one of the many bunk bed type constructions which lined the great hall, I reflected on my mentor's lesson. The last thing I remember is hearing the sound of a tape rewinding and echoing around the listening chamber, intertwined with the soothing tones of Lord Sabre postulating to himself. No easy definitions, dance floor crossover, experience not quantifying. I began to drift, sage and mystic, sage and onion. <laughs> An excerpt from the forthcoming novel Sabres Rip Your Blinkers Off by Andrew Weatherall. Andrew Weatherall. So here we are, listeners, finally at the end of the episode. I hope you found that to be enlightening and enjoyable to listen to. Thanks again to James for his contribution to this episode. That last passage that James read out there was a sort of quixotic definition of ambient music by Andrew Weatherall, which was printed on the back of a great ambient music compilation that James has owned on vinyl since the mid-1990s. It's called the Positiva Ambient Collection, and it is recommended. I think you can find it as a playlist on Spotify, and you can find it as a playlist on YouTube. That's the Positiva Ambient Collection, one of the first ambient records that James ever bought and of course he put it on tape for me and I used to listen to it as well. So you'll find the text of that story that James read out on the page for this episode on my website so if you struggle to follow it all if you couldn't quite follow it you can read it if you like you'll find it on the page for this episode on my website where you will also find a plethora of ambient music Almost all the music that we talked about in this episode, I've put it all onto the page for this episode on my website, including a link to James's EP on Bandcamp, Ambient Mode. Okay, that's his new ambient EP with some of his new ambient music. You can download, you can download that free if you like from Bandcamp, or you can pay James a price of your choice. Like many things in life, it's up to you. But that's all for this episode. As ever, I am curious what you think. So if you have any thoughts left in your head, 
leave them in the comments section, wherever you are listening to this. If this actually made it onto YouTube without being blocked for little bits of copyright infringement, I hope it didn't get blocked because, to be honest, I think we're promoting that music, right? It was a huge advert for a lot of the artists that we talked about there. Uh, but nevertheless, leave your comments, hopefully on YouTube, uh, if you are listening to this there. But of course, most of you will be listening elsewhere. You can always go to my website and leave your thoughts and comments there, teacherluke.co.uk. Okay? But now I shall bid you farewell. And until next time, it's just time for me to say goodbye. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk.